Good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome. We seem to have made it more or less through the first week. Okay. So last time we talked, we introduced the concept of electric field. And we, um, we found that we talked about the fact that any with associated with any charged object, any charged particle is an electric field throughout space that this has a magnitude and a direction and it affects other charged particles, but it doesn't affect the source. And we calculated, we found that the electric field of a point charge at some location R relative to the relative to the source was given by the equation one over four pi epsilon zero our constant times the charge of the point of the source charge divided by the magnitude of this vector r squared times the unit vector r hat so that's one thing you have to know for the quiz. This equation is so central to the whole course that you just have to know it. Okay, don't go to the assignments tab. I don't know what's happening there. If you go to modules, um, if you go to modules, the correct assignment is there. There shouldn't be an assignments tab actually, but maybe maybe there is one anyway. Yeah, we did talk about that. S stick around afterwards, and I'll clear up things about the uh, that assignment. <clears throat> now, what your what your quiz on Thursday is going to be? So Thursday's quiz is going to be you're going to have to calculate the electric field of a point charge. <clears throat> so quiz Thursday. Um, so you've got to calculate the electric field of a point charge, but you've got to do it in vPython. And the reason for this is because this is so much easier to do all these vector manipulations in vPython than it is on your calculator that, that you have to be able to do it. You, of course, can choose from what you want to do when you're working on your own, but you have to actually be able to do it. So we're going to do it right now. And so that you have an example to look at, and I will post this, um, but you can also take a screenshot if you want. Um, and, and so this is what I'm going to ask you to do. You'll do it. It'll, it'll be the usual kind of quiz. You'll have a trinket to do it in. What you have to do is copy your vPython code from the trinket and paste it into an essay field because I can't see it otherwise. And the way it'll be gra graded is I'm going to run it. And, and you, you have to calculate and print the field. OK, I'm going to copy your code, run it, and see if it runs and gives the right answer. So that's how it's going to be graded. Um, so let's make up a problem to do, suppose we have a charge of uh, three, negative three nano coulombs at a location of uh, one, two, three centimeters. That's a two. And you need to find the electric field due to this charge at location negative four, negative five, negative six centimeters. Okay, so that's our problem. So let's do that in vPython. So we'll switch to GlowScript. Um, we'll 
and I'll create a new, whoops, create a new program here. We will call it uh, E of point. And let's make this big so you can read it. So what you do you not need to know? You need to know the equation for electric field, but you don't need to know the value of one over four pi epsilon zero that'll be given to you. Um, so we have the constant is one over four pi epsilon zero equals nine times 10 to the ninth Newton meters squared per Coulomb squared. Um, now, you don't need, since all we're doing is a calculation, you don't need to visualize anything. So in lab, we're going to be working with actually visualizing fields with arrows because patterns of field in 3D space are actually really important. But for this calculation, we're just doing a, a numerical calculation. So we don't need any spheres or anything. We just need to, to calculate things. So we have the charge is equal to negative 3 times 10 to the minus 9th coulombs. And the location of the source, well, the charge is the source particle. So I'm just going to call it our source is equal to a vector 1, 2, 3 centimeters. And the location of the observation location is equal to a vector of negative 4 negative five, negative six centimeters. And now we just use the equation for the electric field of a point charge. So the vector R, now this is the key point, you got to get it correct. The direction is correct. So this is the vector R starts at the source observation, the source location and goes to the observation location. So the initial part, the tail is on the source and the tip is on the observation location, the place where we're calculating the field so that we know what will happen if we ever do put another charge there. Um, so that means that this is the observation location minus the source location. That's right. That's exactly right. And now we can actually just do it in, in one line. So the electric field is one over four pi epsilon zero times the charge of the source divided by, well, it's the magnitude of R. And fortunately we have this nice function in V Python to get a magnitude for us squared times the unit vector in the direction of R. And that's just called hat of R. Now we need to print E will we'll be fancy. We'll say E is, and then we'll print the value of E. And if we didn't make any typing errors, this program will run. And we get about 700, 979, 1259 newtons per coulomb. Okay, so there's not that much to it, but you have to be able to do it. So that's what the quiz is going to be. Questions about that? Okay. So what are we going to do today? Well, today we're gonna we're gonna start worrying about um, situations in which there's more than one charged particle contributing to the electric field in space. Now, this is this is a standard situation. There usually is more than so. How do coulombs relate to watts and volts and all that? Well, a coulomb is actually a fundamental unit of charge. Um, so that's a good question. So coulombs, so the units are 
newtons per coulomb. So there are fundamental units of which all the other units can be broken down into our, our kilograms as the unit of mass. We use meters as the unit of distance. We use seconds as the unit of time. And coulomb is the unit of charge. It's another fundamental unit. Um, so you can't decompose it into anything else. So fundamental units. <clears throat> um, OK, before we do that, let's see if we can just review a little bit by answering a question here. So So here's our question. So we place an electron at location B. That's our source location. And location A is the observation location. It's the location where we might put a test charge to measure the electric field, okay? And the question is, what is going to be the direction of the electric field at location A at location A due to the electron at location B? Um, now think about how we define the definition of electric, the, the direction of electric field. Remember that the, what the direction of the electric field at a location is. So let's see what you said. Oh, we're really close to 90%. All right, let's see what you said. So overwhelmingly, People said the answer was four. And that indeed is the correct answer. So congratulations, good job. So remember that we def the direction of the electric field is defined as the direction which a positive charge would move if it was placed at that location. So if our electron is our electron is is here at location B, then a positive charge at location A would start to move toward the electron. So the electric field made by the electron is in the direction of pointing toward the electron. So excellent. Good job. So today what we're going to worry about is um, superposition of fields. If you've got more than one charged particle, which is extremely likely, we almost always do, um, then how do you calculate the electric field at some observation location? And as you might expect, it's very similar to what we do to calculate net force. You just calculate the contribution of each charge to the, the net field and add it up. Um, <clears throat> So the, uh, and I'm gonna state here the, the superposition principle um, for, for electric fields. So this is the superposition principle, I'll capitalize it. And this is, of course, in the textbook. Ah, OK, so we have a question here. Um, so I think you've mixed up the source and the observation locations. So the, the, the electron is at location B. And remember that we 
we draw the electric field at a location by putting the tail of the electric field vector at the location where we're measuring the field. So if we, what we're doing here is taking our, our proton on a spring and putting it at A and seeing which way it'll move, okay? So another key thing is drawing the tail of the, yeah, I think you had the electron in the wrong place. Okay, so there's two aspects to this. One is the net electric field at any location in space is the vector sum of the individual contributions of the electric fields of all the particles around at other locations. And it doesn't matter how many particles there are, each particle still contributes its own electric field unchanged by the position of the, the, the existence of other particles. Um, so what we're gonna do is the simplest possible Situ superposition situation here. Um, so, so basically, graphically, I mean, what we're doing is is this kind of thing. If we have a positive charge and, I mean, that's a negative charge. It's blue. A negative charge and a positive charge and another positive charge, and we want to measure the electric field at some location. Here, well, we calculate we we take the electric field due to uh, let's make that orange the electric field due to this uh, negative charge, which is going to point toward the negative charge. So that's that's charge one, and that's two and three. We take the electric field due to this positive charge, which points away from the positive charge. Let's say it's a big positive charge. And the electric field due to this other positive charge, which is in a slightly different location. And then we'd have to put them all tip to tail to add them up. So we'd redraw them by, we'd say, here's E1. And then we want to add E2. And then we want to add E3. And the net field goes from the original location to the tip of that vector. So that gives us E net. So we draw our field E net here. And we can do that with numbers too. What we're going to consider is this, a very the simple situation that actually is turns out to be extremely important because it occurs a lot in nature. So what we're going to consider is a thing called a dipole. And it's basically what it sounds like, something with two poles, where in this case, pole means a charge, positive or negative charge. So what a dipole is, is a very simple combination of charges. It's two equal and opposite charges uh, separated by, so we have, a, we have a plus Q and a minus Q where in this situation here, I'm using Q as a positive number, um, separated by a distance S. <clears throat> So we have a negative charge and a positive charge. And this is going to be a, a minus some charge. This is going to be plus the same amount. And this is, that's the distance. So that's a dipole. Um, there are lots of, there are lots of dipoles in nature, for example, any, a magnet is a magnetic dipole, and here we're talking about an electric dipole. And we'll see uh, in not very long, we get to magnetic fields in, in uh, chapter 17, actually. Um, we see that magnetic and electric fields are different, but there are certain similarities in the patterns we see and certain differences in the patterns we see. But a south and a north pole is indeed a magnetic dipole. Here we're talking about electric dipoles. So there are lots of electric dipoles in nature. Any ionic compound like HCl that consists of 
a positively charged hydrogen and a chloride ion. So that's that's a dipole. Um, we'll see that there are, and that's a what we'd call a permanent dipole because the charges are. So we basically have this this sort of cloud of cloud of positive stuff, and then we have a a, a cloud of negative stuff and the distance S would be basically the, the length of the atomic bond here. Um, and we'll see that there are two kinds of dipoles, really there are kinds that are permanent dipoles like this because it's always a dipole. And then there, there are kinds of things that can be made into dipoles by applying a field and then they relax when you take the source of the field away. So dipoles turn out to be very important and what we're going to do is apply this superposition principle to uh, calculate the electric field of a dipole at various locations in space. Um, now, we can do this, uh, we can always do this numerically. And so here is a vPython program in which we do this. Um, so let me make this a little smaller here. Um, okay. So, okay. So here is a dipole. Um, The, uh, the positive charge is the red one, and the negative charge is the blue one. And what we're going to do is just pick a bunch of locations and calculate the electric field numerically and then display it graphically in this program. So our first observation location, this is a vector that points from the center of the dipole to the observation location. So that's, in a certain sense, the vector r, although we'll see it's a little more complicated than that. And at that location, what we want to do is we're going to calculate the electric field uh, due to the positive charge, which points to the right. It points away from the positive charge at this location. And the electric field due to the negative charge, which we visualized in blue, the same color as the negative charge. And then we add those two things together. Now, when you add vectors that are that are collinear, you actually still have to do the same thing. So what you would have to do is, is mentally take this blue arrow and move it so its tail, its direction doesn't change, but its tail is at the tip of the red arrow and it's gonna cover part of it over. And so that's what we're gonna get is the resultant net electric field. Okay, and so the fact that these two things were at a slightly different distances away meant that the electric field due to the positive charge at that location was just a little bit bigger. Let me do that again. <clears throat> so the electric field due to the positive charge is a little bit bigger in magnitude than the electric field due to the negative charge because the positive charge is closer. So the net field points in, in that direction. Now at, at other locations, the angles are different, but we're still going to do the same thing. So here's the electric field due to the positive charge along the line between the positive charge and the observation location. Here's the negative field due to the negative charge. We add those two things. They're not collinear, so we're going to get a field that points kind of in that direction. Um, at this location, you may think about it for a minute and see what you'd expect. Okay, so here's the field due to the positive, field due to the negative, and that's the net field. At this location, we have the field due to the positive and the field due to the negative. And now the net field is in a pretty interesting direction. And down here, you can sort of start to see this mirror symmetry here. So positive, negative, net, up here, okay, the field due to the positive charge 
is away from the positive charge. The field due to the negative charge is toward the negative charge. So the net field is actually perpendicular to this, this green arrow, perpendicular to R. And down here, think about what you expect for a minute. Positive, negative, net field. OK, here we have positive. Now the negative charge is closer. So, so on the midline here, on the, on the midline, they're equidistant from the observation location. Now the negative charge is closer. Down here, the negative charge is closer, so it has a bigger contribution. Here, the negative charge is quite a bit closer. And finally, we're back on the axis, but the other side of the axis. So we have the negative, the positive charge is farther, the negative charge is bigger, and it's actually OK to draw an arrow that goes through the charge. That's fine. Um, and so we've got this, this pattern of electric field. And this is a, what we call it a, a pattern, a very familiar, it's going to be a very familiar pattern of dipole field. Now, notice that it does not look like the field of a point charge. OK, remember that the field of a point charge, if it was a positive charge, it pointed away from the charge, kind of like a sea urchin. If it was negative charge, it pointed toward the charge. Um, so, so this is a much more complicated pattern of field. And so motion of a charge uh, near here might be kind of interesting, um, something you get to explore in lab. OK, so another question is, what's the distance dependence of the field going to be like? Is the, is the field going to fall off like 1 over r squared? Well, it might or it might not. And we could do a numerical calculation here. Um, so uh, here is a program, let me make this bigger, that just calculates the electric field of the dipole by adding up the fields just the way we were doing it. So that's the red line. And then compares it to a 1 over r squared graph so that we're starting at a distance that's uh, two times the dipole separation away. And we see that what we'd expect for a 1 over r squared dependence is the blue line. And what we're getting here just by our numerical calculation is actually a field that falls off much faster than that. So maybe it's not 1 over r squared, but what is it? So in order to find that out, we're going to need to do some algebra to see if we can actually derive a what we call an analytical uh, solution that'll tell us the distance dependence. Now, we can always do this numerically, and that's fine. But if we want some kind of feel for physically what's, what's, what's happening, um, then it would be really nice to have an actual equation. So the question is, can we get an equation? So what we're going to be doing today is trying to derive equations for the field of a dipole. And we're not going to get a general result. But what we can get, what we will be able to get, is a result for um, the electric field at locations along what we call the dipole axis. And also at any location, a different equation for any location on what we call the perpendicular axis of the dipole. So we can find uh, algebraic analytical expressions for, for the, the electric field of a dipole along those axes. And we're going to get, and, and we'll see that that'll give us a distance dependence. Now, there are two, two reasons we're doing this and two, two sort of takeaway messages. So, so what's important? Because just doing algebra isn't all that exciting. The, the first piece is, is 
that we have to convert uh, convert geometry to algebra. So we have to we have to have a core. We have to make a coordinate system and use and use symbols. So we need a coordinate system. We need symbols for distances for locations. And this is something we're going to do a lot of when we're calculating the electric field or the magnetic field of uh, more than one object. So, so that's going to be an important theme. And so, and, and sometimes we'll actually be able to use, um, sometimes we'll be able to use calculus. In this case, we won't need calculus, but we'll see by when you get to chapter 15, and we got lots and lots of charges that there are times when we can use calculus to help us add these things up. Um, the second important message is that is about approximations. A lot of people coming in, come into physics thinking approximations are not legitimate in physics or ex physics is exact, but that's not really true at all. Approximations are really a key part of trying to understand the world. They're important. <clears throat> they're, they're necessary to help us understand things qualitatively. And the approximations are your friend. So you will end up using lots of approximate equations, but you have to understand the approximations we make. So those are the messages that, that we need to take away here. Okay, so I'm gonna start with a situation where we're gonna get the electric field of a dipole along the perpendicular axis, actually. Um, because that's actually corresponds to what we did in that in that program there. So I'm going to pick a dipole, and the orientation. We're going to have to come up with an equation that's independent of the orientation of the dipole. Eventually, for now, I'll put it along the x-axis. So this is going to be our minus q. That's going to be our plus q, and this is a distance s. And we want to find the electric field due to this dipole at some location on the perpendicular axis here. <clears throat> now we saw from the from doing it in V Python that what we what we we should get is that we we need to add up the field of the, the positive charge and the field of the negative charge. And to do that, we're going to have to calculate these two fields separately. So we're going to need this, this vector R plus from the positive charge to the observation location. And that's going to give us a field E plus. Then we need the vector R minus from the negative charge to the observation location, and that will give us a field equal in magnitude but toward the negative charge. So that's an E minus. I don't think it looks equal in magnitude. Let's make it a little bigger. Um, there, that looks bitter. So here's our R vector, and the net field ends up being the sum of those. So if we put this R minus, add it to that, we're going to get, we should get a net field in that direction. So let's see how we do this algebraically. OK. So we need a coordinate system. So let's put the origin at the center of dipole of the dipole. We could put it anywhere, but this is the logical place. And we need that'll let us that'll give us the locations of the positive and negative charges, but we need the location of the observation location. So we need to introduce a variable 
y here, which is the distance the, along the, the y-axis to the, the observation location. Okay, so now we just need to calculate these two fields, but we need to do it symbolically. So let's calculate E plus. So, so we need this relative position vector R plus, and that's going to be the observation location minus the source location. Well, in our coordinate system, the observation location is at 0, Y, 0. And the source location is at, well, we put the, the, the origin in the center of the dipole, so that makes it at an S over 2, 0, 0. And so that means that our r plus the vector r plus here going to, from the source to the observation location is going to be a negative s over 2 y 0. And we're going to need the magnitude of this vector, which is going to be equal to uh, the square root of minus s over 2 squared plus y squared plus 0 squared, which is the square root of s over 2 squared plus y squared. And that lets us calculate the unit vector r plus hat, which is just r plus divided by the magnitude of r plus. And now the, uh, so now we can get the, uh, whoops. Okay, so now we could calculate the electric field of, since we have all that information, we could calculate the electric field of the plus charge. So let's just do it E plus is equal to, let me move that down. So we've got a 1 over 4 pi epsilon 0. We have a Q over the magnitude of R squared. So that's going to be an uh, quantity S over 2 squared plus Y squared times R hat, which is a minus S over 2 Y 0 divided by the square root of the magnitude of R, which is, of course, S over 2 squared plus Y squared. So that's, that's the E plus. That's our algebraic expression for it. We can, we can hope that this is going to get simpler. OK, so now we need the field of the negative charge. We have R minus. Well, there's just going to be an unavoidable amount of geometry and algebra for, for some of these operations. There's not much we can do. So the observation location is still the same, 0, y, 0. The source location is now a minus s over 2, 0, 0. So r minus is equal to um, plus s over 2 y 0. <clears throat> and so we can get the magnitude of r minus the same way uh, we can, so we can get the magnitude of r minus, we can get r minus hat. And after all that, we find that the electric field of the, uh, we won't crank through it here, but the electric field of the negative charge is going to be equal to um, <clears throat> 1 over 4 pi
Yes. So remember that we decided to call the charges. We we decided to call the charges uh, minus Q and plus Q here. So this this is a that's a plus Q. That's the the charge of the of the positive charge. Okay, so um, so what this is going to come out to one over four pi epsilon zero. Now here we've got this minus Q because we're talking about the minus charge. Okay, the magnitude of R is still the same in this location, so we have an S over two squared plus Y squared here. Um, and we're multiplying by uh, S over two Y zero uh, times the square root of, divided by the square root of S over two squared plus Y squared. So that's, that's what we get. We can do a little consolidating because um, algebraically, because these two terms we have, we can write this as, uh, S over two squared plus Y squared to the one half. And that means we can, we can combine these, these terms to get a three halves. So we can make this a little bit simpler just by writing one over four pi epsilon zero minus Q over S over two squared plus y squared to the three halves times s over two y zero. And we could do the same thing up here. So when we add them all up, so now what we want to do is just add these things. So we want e net. Um, is going to be now we're going to we're going to okay so let's let's do this here so we can just kind of see where the algebra goes so we have a 1 over 4 pi epsilon 0 plus q over s over 2 squared plus y squared to the 3 halves times negative s over 2 y 0 <clears throat> Now, when we add this all up, uh, we've got a, here we've got a plus Q times a minus S over two, and here we've got a minus Q times a plus S over two. So when we add it all up, we're gonna get one over four pi epsilon zero Q times S. But here, because of this minus sign, the the y's are going to the y's are going to cancel. So this minus q y and this plus q y are going to add up to zero. <clears throat> divided by s over two squared plus y squared to the three halves, and the direction is is negative one zero zero. <clears throat> Okay, so this isn't very general though, because um, our dipole doesn't have to be aligned this way on the x-axis. So for example, um, we could have a dipole that was plus and minus on the x-axis, and that would reverse the direction. We could have a dipole aligned this way. We could have a dipole aligned that way. We could have a dipole 
align that way. Okay, so this it could rotate. So this this being tied to our x and y coordinate system isn't isn't really all that great. So for right now, we're going to do two things. So first, we're going to replace y with 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 the with the variable r which just makes it a more general because it doesn't have to be on the y axis and second we're going to use the we're just going to talk about the magnitude so we're going to and so in that case what we get is that the magnitude of the electric field on the perpendicular axis at some location um, a distance r from the center of the dipole is going to be 1 over 4 pi epsilon 0 q times s over s over 2 quantity squared plus y squared to the 3 halves. <clears throat> Now, this is not an equation you have to memorize. Uh, this is going to be R. Sorry, the whole point of replacing that with R was to put an R in there. Now, that still doesn't isn't all that helpful because it it uh, it doesn't really give us a very clear distance dependence. Okay, where's the S in the numerator comes from? It comes from this unit vector here. So here we have um, in the numerator, we have a Q times negative S, this vector negative S over two Y zero. And here we have negative Q times so if we add those two things together, what we're really going to get is a 1 over 4 pi epsilon 0. We're going to get um, a 1 over uh, this whole thing to the 3 halves. And what we're going to get here is the sum of this vector minus q s over 2 y 0 plus a um, minus sorry minus q s over 2 a minus q y 0 plus so that's from r from e plus now we're going to get a another minus q s over 2 a minus uh, that's a that's a plus q y. This is a minus q y zero over all that stuff to the three halves. <clears throat> so the the plus q y and the minus q y cancel, and adding these two things together gives us a. a a minus qs and we take the minus sign out into the the unit vector here well i think if we work through it step by step you'd actually get there i'm skipping steps i want you to see the the process but not agonize over the algebraic details this is in the book so you can go over it But but you sort of focused on a super important thing, which is this this quantity QS in the numerator. Because if we go back to, to physically, notice that if the charge gets bigger, that means both charges increase in magnitude. Um, 
the electric field gets bigger, or if we move them farther apart, if the separation S gets bigger, the, the field gets bigger. And of course, as the charges get closer and closer and closer and closer together and S gets smaller and smaller, eventually they end up in the same place and then their field is actually zero, so that makes sense. Now, here's, here's a question for you. Um, so here's the question. Uh, so we have this, this equation for the magnitude of E. So could we just multiply by r hat to get a vector? So, yeah. <laughs> okay, well, that's one reason. It's just, that sounds too easy. Um, you're, you're both right. It's not, it's, it's not, it doesn't work, and here's why. Um, uh, well, here's, here was our dipole. Which way do we have it? Minus on the left. So here's our dipole. Uh, here's our observation location. So the vector uh, r presumably points from the center of the dipole to the observation location, but the field is going that way. So r hat is that way, and the field is that way. So, so as you say, Seth, that we don't really have an easy direction to multiply by. And so one thing to say is that, that so no, um, so that's the wrong direction. So one thing to say is that we're going to give you equations, and what the book does is give you equations for magnitudes, and that we'll have to um, we'll have to uh, get the direction of the field by just looking at the the dipole in the physical situation and seeing which way the field is going to point, and that's a legitimate answer. Now we may have a slightly more formal answer later if you want one. However, we still haven't solved our problem of getting a decent distance dependence because we've got this sort of messy thing here. It doesn't really clear exactly how that's going to go like, like R. And here's where we can make a useful approximation. So let's rewrite our equation here. So E on the perpendicular axis of the dipole is equal to 1 over 4 pi epsilon 0. We had a QS over the quantity s over 2 squared plus r squared to the 3 halves. Now, in most situations, for, for most real dipoles, the dipole separation is really quite small. And we're usually much farther away. So if you think of an HCl molecule, for example, it's tiny. That distance s is what on the order of 10 to the minus 10th meters. And we could be a centimeter away, and that's a huge uh, it's hugely larger than S. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to say if, not exactly, we can't assume that S is zero because if we assume that S was zero, then we'd get a zero in the denominator, in the numerator, and then the whole thing would be zero, and we, we know it's not actually. So that's, that's a problem. But we can do something a little bit similar. We can say if the observation location R is much farther away than the separation. So, so here's our dipole, and so this little teeny distance is, is S. And if our observation location, uh, if so if this is R, oops. Okay, didn't mean to get that pen. Um, so if our observation location R is farther, far away compared to the separation, which actually isn't hard to do, 
then s isn't zero, but s over two is gonna be much less than r, and s over two squared was gonna be an even smaller number, so that's a whole lot less than r squared. So we can't, we can't just blind, bl give a blanket, say s is zero, but we can say that in the denominator, we have this really big number, r squared, and s over two squared is gonna be a really small number. So our approximation, we can say our approximation can be that one over four pi epsilon zero QS in the denominator, we can neglect the S over two. So we can say it's basically gonna be approximately zero plus R squared to the three halves, which gives us one over four pi epsilon zero QS over R cubed. So as long as we're not right up against the dipole, yeah. So this is this is this is a this is we're 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 doing this a little judiciously. We're saying that compared to the distance to the observation location, the dipole separation is very small. That's right. Foreshadowing at the beginning of lecture, I did, um, and so. So now this is a pretty useful equation, actually, because it says that it gives us a distance dependence that's, and it's clearly not a one over R squared distance dependence. In fact, it's a one over R cubed distance dependence. So the magnitude of E on the perpendicular axis is proportional to one over R cubed. So approximations are our friend. This actually gives us a distance dependence we can understand. Okay, so we're partway there. We've, we've got the electric field of our dipole that was minus here and plus here along the perpendicular axis. So we, we have an equation now that where R is our variable and as long as, and, and, and this, is, this is valid, as long as R is greater than S, meaning that well, the observation location is much farther away than the separation between the two charges and the dipole. So we, we can get the electric field at any location here. And right now we just have to get the field by the direction of the field by inspection. So we have to actually go through this reasoning of saying, so down here, we'd say, okay, the electric field due to the positive charge would point like that. The electric field due to the negative charge would point like that. So we conclude that the net field would be in that direction. What we don't have is the electric field on this other sort of symmetric location, which is the dipole axis. So this is the perpendicular axis. This is just the axis of the dipole. And to do that, we go through something that's exactly the same procedure, except that the, the, the R vector comes out different in those cases, because as we saw in the, in the VPython animation, um, the, uh, the contributions are collinear. So we're adding two collinear vectors. OK, about, about how much bigger than S does R need to be for this to work well? I'm so glad you asked. Um, 
so let's see if we can figure it now now the answer of course is going to be well it depends on on how accurate you want to be right um but but let's actually look at a different program here, which is, okay. So what this program does is it just compares the um, exact calculation to the approximate calculation for a particular dipole. And so the, the exact calculation is in red, that's, um, and, and, and it's plotted, so this is the magnitude of E, and it's plotted as to the ratio of R over S. So if R is equal to S, so R, we're only a distance S away from the center of the dipole, we see that this really isn't very good. We're getting, a, what, almost one times 10 to the 10th for the electric field here. Uh, and the exact calculation and our approximate calculation is, is about half of what it ought to be. But notice how fast these things come together. So when R is only twice as big as S, these things are actually very close. And by the time it's only three times as big as S, they're, they're practically indistinguishable. Now that's a lot better than you'd think it would be for having made that approximation. Um, yeah, yeah, that, that's actually pretty surprising. It turns out to be just a much better approximation than you'd really think. Um, so if you're right on top of the dipole, you can't do it that way. But if you're not, it's actually pretty reasonable. <clears throat> now, we could go through the whole thing again for the, the on the axis. Um, we're not going to work through the algebra uh, because you've seen, you've seen the basic idea once. But what we get, um, so the, uh, so on the axis, what we get for the, uh, the result when we, um, when we add, we go through that whole calculation, the, the exact thing we get is a one over four pi epsilon zero two Q S R divided by R minus S over two squared times R plus S over two squared. And if we make that, that same approximation, so, so, if R is greater than S, we make the same approximation and we get a one over four pi epsilon zero uh, two QS over R cubed. So on the axis. Where again, R is the distance from the, the the center of the dipole to the observation location and S is the dipole separation. So just to summarize, so on the perpendicular axis, E perpendicular is approximately one over four pi epsilon zero QS over R cubed. And on the dipole axis, the magnitude of E is approximately one over four pi epsilon zero two QS over R cubed. So, okay. Um, now we could do a calculation, but I think you can plug numbers into equations. So there's, um, there's another point I want to make here about these, about these equations, is that we see this quantity QS showing up in the numerator in both cases. 
And so the magnitude of the field in both cases is, is proportional to this product of the charge on one object, the positive, the charge of the positive charge, say, times the dipole separation. Um, and so this is an important quantity. And in fact, it has a name. It's called the, the electric dipole moment. So electric It's called, it's the product of Q times S. Now, unfortunately, it has a symbol. And unfortunately, the symbol used is P. This is not momentum. Um, and in fact, we actually can uh, it, it is sometimes written as a vector. So if we have our dipole minus here plus here, here's our dipole, then the vector P points from the negative charge to the positive charge, basically it points in the direction that the electric field at some location on the axis outside the dipole would point, okay? So we could also just write P in these equations, the magnitude of P instead of QS. Um, okay, so let's, we don't have very much more time. Okay, let's do one, one question. Uh, Oh, so here's here's another thing to take away from this that's important. So here's our axes, here's our dipole, uh, plus Q, minus Q. Notice that at locations on the dipole axis, at some location a distance R from, um, from, the center of the dipole, so this is a distance r. The electric field is proportional to, to 2 times the dipole moment, 2 qs over r cubed. Whereas on the, on the perpendicular axis, the same distance away, so, so this, is, this distance is r, uh, it's only proportional to qs, so it's actually half as big on the perpendicular axis at the same uh, at the same distance. Okay, so let's try one question. Um, let's try. So these patterns of field are actually going to be pretty important. So here's um, here's a question. So what's the direction? They only per pertain to dipoles. That's right. So we spent a lot of time on um, on the field of a very simple charge configuration, but it turns out to be extremely important. So. Here's our question. What's the direction of the electric field of this dipole location C due to the dipole? So first ask yourself, are we on which axis are we on, the perpendicular axis or the dipole axis? And then second, what's the, where's the positive charge and where's the negative charge and how do they add up? Okay, let's see what you said. So 
So the most popular answer is eight, which is correct. So good job. But there's a little little scatter here. Um, so how do we do this? Because we are going to need to know these directions, and we. So the first thing to remember is that this is so. So what's the dipole axis? That's the dipole axis. So this must be the perpendicular axis. And we remember that that up here we saw that the electric field was was at a right angle to the perpendicular axis. Okay, so it's either going to point this way or that way. Okay, we don't have to. Um, worry too much about it. So the electric field due to the positive charge is going to point toward the positive charge. The electric, uh, sorry, away from the positive charge. Electric field points away from the positive charge. The electric field of the negative charge points toward the negative charge. And so the sum is actually going to point that, that way. Well, okay, Seth, so here's here's a thing you can think about. So we had, um, and I'll leave you with this. So here's our here's our dipole from before. And so we had the the electric field on the the axis here was pointing that way. The electric field up here was pointing that way. If we consider the dipole moment P, then the electric field on the axis is in the direction of, of P hat. And the electric field on the perpendicular axis is actually in the direction of minus P hat. So that we really could write these equations is, is one over four pi epsilon zero uh, two QS over R cubed P hat or two times the magnitude of P and one over four pi epsilon zero QS over R cubed times a minus P hat so you can actually write it as a vector equation if you want to. Okay. So, um, so for attendance, what I'd like you to do is to type in chat uh, what what you what you think was the most important idea we talked about here.